show often by myself. I'm the host, the producer, if you will. But every now and then I've got something to say and I will do a live by myself, which is really weird because it's, I get so used to interviewing people that I forget what it's like to talk. <laughs> so I just want to give a little bit of a uh, background story or housekeeping, especially because, you know, with YouTube, this might be your first time seeing me. And if it is, welcome. And I hope you'll consider subscribing to my channel and also hitting the notification bell, because what that does is it tells you whenever I go live, we do go live very every day. Actually, I have gone live in case you're unfamiliar with my work and my show. I've gone live every single day since March 20th, 2020. And I've done that uh, when the pandemic began, actually, it was sheltering in place. And I just got to make sure that I'm live because I'm not seeing it on YouTube. And if that's not the case, I'm going to start over because this is too important. Charles, am I live? Huh. Okay. Well, maybe nobody's typing in the chat. That's why I didn't know. All right. Well, good to know. So if you want to know what the schedule is, and today is show 1,157, please consider signing up to be on my mailing list at chefaj.com because every week, usually Saturday, but sometimes Sunday, we send you a schedule of who the guests are. So the guests are on my regular show, which is called Chef AJ Live. It airs every single day at 11 a.m. Pacific time, and it has for two and a half years now. We've never missed a day. And there's many days that I've gone live twice, even up to five times a day. These are not necessarily scheduled shows. So you maybe would like to know, and to know that you would want to be subscribed on YouTube to know for the bonus shows. But the regular shows were, were pretty consistent. So I just got back from Rancho La Puerta, and I want to tell you a little bit about that experience because there have been lots of questions on social media about the experience and the desserts that you're seeing. And that's kind of what this we're going to talk about today is how to satisfy your sweet tooth without using sugar and how I actually, after a lifelong, well, let's say 43-year sugar addiction, I was finally able to find a sweeter life with permanently giving up sugar. And that, that does tie into why I was at Rancho La Puerta. So I'm going to tell you that story. But first, I just want to say a couple of things. I forgot what they were. I should have taken notes about the show. Okay, so you know about the show. It's 11 o'clock every day. And okay, I'm just going to jump into it because sorry, I'm a little bit tired. When I fly, I get a little bit uh, tired, but let's let's get to the topic in hand. As I mentioned, I just got back from Rancho La Puerta. And if you follow me on social media, and by the way, YouTube, where you're watching now is social media. And I want to really say this before we get started, that this is a YouTube show. I use a platform called Restream, which allows me to also stream it to Facebook and Twitter. But I don't go on there. I can't see your comments there. And so a lot of times we have doctors on the show, Dr. McDougall, Dr. Lyle, they come on every month and you guys have questions. And I would love to be able to get those doctors to answer your questions. But because I can't see what you write on Twitter and Facebook, I can't, I can't answer the questions. So if you would like to interact with me in what I call the Zoomunity, which is the community on Zoom where we meet on YouTube every day, there's several hundred of us. We know each other by name. We even take role. You need to be watching on YouTube. Now, of course, if you're watching the replay, it doesn't really matter where you watch. But if you want to communicate with me in real time, which is what I do even while I'm hosting, you've got to be watching on YouTube. So that's the way it is. You don't have to necessarily subscribe, but you do have to watch there if you want to ask a question either to me or one of the guests. Now, when the doctor is on, especially Dr. Lyle, Dr. McDougall, one of the big wigs, Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Greger, we can only take questions that have been sent in to our mailing list in advance. And that is the reason why you would want to subscribe to the mailing list to find out who the guests are. Or if you don't want to subscribe, you can still send the question in to help at chefaj.com, but we do give priority to our subscribers. And those of you that have sent questions in in advance know that to be true. All right, so a lot of you know me now as a person that's slender, and I have a whole life before this, before the age of 62. I write a lot about it in my book, let's see. If you don't know, my primary job, believe it or not, is I am an author and um, I write books and I also teach classes both in person and online. And I wrote a best-selling book, I think it was 2016 or 18, called The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss, where I chronicle my story of being obese from the age of five till the age of 52. Really, I've only been slender for 10 years now. I call myself the nouveau thin. But the reason I 
was obese was because I believe I suffered from a food addiction, specifically sugar addiction. And giving up sugar was the best decision I ever made. That's why I appear in a lot of these summits that aren't even vegan, like the Kick Sugar Summit, the Quit Sugar Summit, because even if somebody is unwilling to go vegan, I really do believe there's a benefit in quitting processed food and sugar. That's why I wrote another book called Unprocessed. So my, uh, my abstinence or my sobriety date is July 6, 2003. That is the last time that I had sugar. It was a Sunday. And I remember it because it was a very profound day. Up until that point, up until the age of 43, pretty much all I ate was sugar and processed food. And at that point, I had already been vegan for 26 years, but I was not unprocessed. I basically ate vegan junk food, which when you think about it, was pretty hard to do back then because we didn't have, you know, gardening meat and impossible burger and better than whatever all this stuff is and day of cheese. We didn't even have vegan processed food when I became vegan, which was over 45 years ago on September 1st, 1977. But, you know, an addict will find a way. And I found a way to basically just eat crap. Started my day with Coke Slurpees. If the sugar and caffeine wasn't bad enough, I would add eight pumps of vanilla syrup. I would have a Dr. Pepper Big Gulp every day for lunch, 48 ounces, because 20 years ago, that was the biggest size. And basically, instead of eating from the healthy food groups that I recommend today, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, I ate from my own food groups, candies, cakes, cookies, pies, maybe five food groups, ice creams. It was vegan, but it wasn't healthy. And that's how I got to be close to 200 pounds, but even more than being obese, because I've been used to being obese. I was obese since the age of five. I weighed 160 pounds at the age of 11 when I wasn't even five feet tall. I developed what they call pre-colon cancer from basically eating just sugar, sugar, flour, oil, you know, at caffeine and really no fruits and vegetables, no fiber whatsoever. That's why I'm so passionate about this, especially because so many people in my family had their colon removed or died of colon cancer. And I don't want that to happen to any of you. So I really believe that giving up sugar is one of the best things that people can do, whether they're overweight or not, whether they're vegan or not. Sugar is not a food, it's a poison. And when I look at it, it's a white powder. I look at it the same way I would rat poison. I wouldn't eat any white powders, whether it's rat poison or sugar or cocaine or flour or salt. Well, like salt sneaks in. Obviously, if you travel, I was at Rancho, I can't always guarantee, but I don't, I don't add salt to my food. So July 6, 2003 was the last day that I had sugar. I was dropped off at the, I was picked up actually at the train station in San Diego. I was going to the Optimum Health Institute in Lemon Grove, and I heard that if you got caught with contraband in your room, they would kick you out and not give you a refund. And I'm a very frugal person, and at that time, I $175 was a lot of money to me, so I figured, you know, I'm going to do what they say, as difficult as it was. I remember I had the cab driver take me to uh, 7-Eleven, which was my stomping ground. It's, it's really, you know, when, when I think back, I mean, it's so hard to even remember those days of being an addict because, I, you know, nobody's proud of being an addict, but the things I did to get my fix. But I remember the one time that we had to move, I, I, I only could live somewhere that was walking distance to a 7-Eleven because when you're as addicted as I was to both sugar and caffeine, you... I mean, I couldn't even drive to get my fix. Some days my husband would get it. He really didn't want to enable me. So I had to live walking distance to a 7-Eleven. And it's funny because I found a place in Studio City where I was working as an activity director at a retirement home that was literally equidistant between two 7-Elevens, which is important because when you're an addict, if what if one of the Coke Slurpee machines was broken? And I remember yelling at them when I couldn't get my fix because sometimes the machine was broken and I'm not going to have like another flavor like cherry or, you know, whatever they had uh, seven up because I needed both the sugar and the caffeine and lots of it to start my day. So on Sunday, July 6, 2003, the cab driver picks me up. He takes me to 7-Eleven. I buy my last Coke Slurpee, my last Dr. Pepper. And <laughs> which, <laughs> drinking them that quickly is not that fun, but I knew that, it, you know, that the writing was on the wall. And I remember working with the psychologist there. If you've ever been to the Optimum Health Institute, it's a fabulous place. And I don't know if Dr. Bob is still there, but basically we did, we did these exercises like role-playing where we're basically, you know, I broke up with my favorite doctor at the time, Dr. Pepper, and of course, the Coke Slurpees. And, you know, sometimes I think, you know, because on July 7th, uh, 7 or July 11th, 7-11 gives away free Slurpees. And it's always been hard for me to refrain, 
resist free food. I mean, I think that's the case with everyone. Dr. Lyle has talked about why that is. And I always think, well, maybe I should just get a small one and taste it and see what it would be like. And I don't think it's going to put me back into my addiction, but I don't think I would like it. I think, first of all, I'd be too sweet. And I think it would be very, very chemical tasting. So how this pertains to Rancho La Puerta is that um, I've been going to Rancho La Puerta for 11 years. I've probably been there 22 times now. And it is not a vegan spa. So those of you interested in going, this is not what this session is about. Just please email help at chefaj.com and we'll give you all the information because we are starting. I didn't know we could do this, but we're starting to get groups that go specifically to see me. I just got back there and because it was such short notice, this was a fill-in date. This wasn't my scheduled date. We only got five people, but we had a fabulous time being with like-minded people and, and you know spending time with people that are already like us, that eat like us. And so we have another group planned in July where there's already 30 people. So uh, that's the limit, by the way, 30 people. So we're going to try to get other dates. But anyway, the point is the reason I chose next July for my date at Rancho, well, one, because it's discounted rates anyway, because of the summer and then discounted rates because you're going with me, but because July 6th will be my 20 year anniversary of not having any sugar. And so I'm very proud of that. And we're going to celebrate at a place making sugar-free desserts, which is my specialty because I was a pastry chef at a place that basically doesn't use sugar. I, I mean, there, you know, I, I, they do sometimes put a little bit of, I, you know, agave they in a recipe, but for the most part, they really don't use sugar or flour or processed food and even oil and salt, very, very minimal. So I'm very happy about that. Anyway, so I was posting my, uh, my classes on social media because we do these hands-on cooking classes. They're, they're fabulous. And uh, so we make desserts and we made the chocolate mousse. That's a really, really popular one uh, it, in general. And we, then the apple pie that won't make you die. And people keep asking me for that recipe. And there is a way to get it. I'm going to tell you at the end of the class, but it's like literally probably one of the, I don't know if it's the best recipe I ever created because it really depends on what your palate is, but it's it's probably my favorite because it's the one I make every week. It's Charles's favorite. And it's, it's as clean as you can get in terms of not having any sugar or flour or, you know, any, I obviously don't use oil or salt and also being low in fat. And so I'll tell you how to get apple pie that won't make you die. And also the perfectly pear recipe in a little bit, but I want to tell a little bit about my story because, you know, those of you that started watching because it's a show that I interview guests may not know much about me and, you know, Hey, here's your chance to learn. So we have the holidays coming up. Not by the holidays, I don't mean just, you know, Christmas or Kwanzaa or Hanukkah or whichever you celebrate, or maybe you don't celebrate in New Year's Eve and New Year's Day and, and of course Thanksgiving. But we have, I think, one of the most dangerous days of the year for people that are sugar addicts. And that is Halloween. And I have seen more people relapse on that day, and I'm not joking with a fun size snicker bar, than any other day of the year. It's the egregious amount of candy that's available that time of year. And it's not just for people that go, I mean, different if like you went trick or treating to get it, which some people, you know, children do. I'm not telling you not to do that, but I'm telling you that if you're a sugar addict or food addict, don't let the kid bring it back in the house, you know, let, let him have his few pieces and, you know, donate the rest of the armed forces, or there's places that will actually turn it into cash for you because they know how bad it is. Usually dental offices will do that. But I've seen people like, once they have sugar, they don't easily recover from that relapse of sugar. You know, it's kind of like an alcoholic, one drink, one drunk. And people that are very vulnerable to sugar addiction, like I was, we can't have a little bit here and there and bounce right back. We can't have a drop, a morsel or a crumb. And of course, there's going to be genetic variation. It's going to be on a bell curve. There might be some people that can have it once in a while. But if that's you, then you don't need my help. You just keep doing what you're doing. And there are people that are happy with their health and their weight. And I always tell them, do the least restrictive plan you can do that will get the, the results you seek. But there are a lot of people that really suffer from food addiction and it's usually sugar addiction. You know, it's not so much the salt that has made them, you know, uh, have, I mean, salt can be a problem too, but the good news is, is 
you can make amazing desserts without salt. You really don't need it. That's not what makes dessert delicious is the salt. It's the sweetness, which we're going to talk about how to satisfy your sweet tooth without using sugar. But I have seen so many people relapse on Halloween because you go to the bank and they have the candy there. You go to, you know, wherever you go. And it's very hard to resist because you might be able to control your own environment. But if you're going to leave your house, you know, you're going to see that. And, and the thing is, is like, especially if you're like me, you're like, oh my God, it's so cute. You know, I mean, you know, it's just, it's just a little piece. It's fun size. Oh, I didn't know this one came fun size. And then there you have it. You're just going to have one piece and then you eat the whole, you know, plastic pumpkin full. And, and I, you know, I, I can't say this, this person's name, but I literally, you know, have, have seen, I remember this one gentleman and he had his own business. And so we felt we have to have the candy there. And the truth is, is if you're a business owner, you don't. I've worked with people in that situation and they started giving away other things like pens or bottle openers with their company names that were much more valuable and appreciated by the customers. Those that felt they had to have food were giving away miniature Lara bars or fruit bars that are fruit only. I think they're called just fruit. You can get them at Costco or even little bags of nuts or cutie oranges. So you don't have to have food at your work. And if you're a human resource director, you really don't let me come work with your company. That's what I used to do in LA is I would do uh, lunch and words and in services because the human resources person was the one responsible for ordering all the crap from Costco in the break room. And I've worked with companies where they've done challenges where they actually, instead of having, you know, the pretzels with the peanut butter in them and all the crap, actually got a Vitamix at Costco and started making green smoothies because, you know, when employees are sick, it doesn't benefit the company. And, and, and sugar is so inflammatory that even if you somehow manage to eat it and maintain your weight, it, it, it it's not going to help you with your health. And, you know, I have not had any plastic surgery. These, you know, people say I use filters. Okay. Well, they're not very good filters because you see all these lines here, but I will tell you that for the last 19 years of being off sugar and eating a large amount of fruits and vegetables, which I didn't do, my skin health has improved. I wish I could find pictures from that long ago, but they all were destroyed in the earthquake. But my skin was horrible. I had spots all over. They were called melasma. And between not eating sugar, eating fruits and vegetables, and also staying out of the sun, or if I'm in the sun, using a full coverage hat, at 62, my skin is better than it's ever been. So if, if you don't want to go off sugar for health reasons, maybe consider going off it for vanity. You know, before I became a chef, 20 years ago, I was an activity director at a retirement home. And you really could see the difference in people as they aged, whether or not they drank alcohol or ate sugar. The ones that drank, you know, you can talk all they want about the blue zones, but I'm telling you for years, this was my job. And I could see in front of me because alcohol was allowed and sugar was allowed. They could have ice cream all day if they wanted. The ones that ate healthy aged better. They looked better, not just in terms of being more slender and having more beautiful skin. But the ones that, well, obviously smoking is the worst thing you can do for your skin and your health. Hopefully you know not to do that, whether you eat sugar or not. By the way, I don't know if you know that they actually put sugar in cigarettes as if they're not addictive enough. But the ones that ate sugar and drank alcohol, they did not look as good. And they always, always, want, even if they weren't overweight, the old people always seem to want candy. Like they always had like a Werther's, you know, in their mouth or something like that. So uh, it's, a, it's a lifelong addiction for some people. I remember this one lady named <laughs> Birdie, 101 years old. I, I mean, she was as bad of a sugar addict as I ever was. So um, you'll age better without it. And, and actually, Starting tomorrow, we have Longevity Week on Chef AJ Live, where we have people, vegans in their 60s, 70s, and 80s um, that look amazing. And um, I don't think any of them eat sugar. We'll find out this week, though, to, to, um, to be sure about that. So let's see. I'm going to look at my notes because I don't want to digress. So um, got off sugar, yeah, 20 years ago. What, what you may, oh, the, the Halloween thing. So um, he had the, the candy. It was a Snickers bar. It was a fun size Snickers bar. And he literally went down such a dark place that within three months he was, um, he was on dialysis and then he had to have a kidney transplant. I mean, that's an extreme version, but what I hear all the time is that, you know, you know, like they say on the commercials, once you pop, you just can't stop. Once people succumb to the temptation of the pleasure trap, but specifically sugar, it's really hard for them to get back on track. And they gain quite a bit of weight between Halloween and January, which, you know, the, depending on when you Google it, they'll say five pounds, sometimes it's 15 pounds. But what the research has shown when I've looked into it is that's weight that's not generally ever taken off or easily taken off. And that's why as busy as I am right now, because I have a three book deal with my publisher and I'm late already for the first one and I'm in trouble. Uh, 
we teach so many classes the last quarter because that's when people seem to need the most support because they're not getting it from their family and friends. Okay, so what you may not know is this, because you only, some of you have only known me for maybe this is your first time seeing me or a few years, but what you don't know is really the whole story of how I was able to successfully quit sugar. And the way I did it was I inched into it. And what I mean by that, and you know, this is really important, especially if you're somebody that's interested in ha permanent habit change. There's a book called uh, Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg. And he talks about how most people, when they're making a permanent change, do like baby steps. So in other words, we, we do the Truth About Weight Loss Summit, and then we do a 21-day program. And the program is the way I eat now, which I think is the healthiest way to eat, if you're able to do it, which is a plant-exclusive diet of whole foods without sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt, and caffeine, but it's too austere or draconian or strict for most people to go from here or from here to here, or however you want to do it, or here to here, or here to here. Many people have to transition slowly. And the thing is, if all your, if your only problem is excess weight, transition as slowly as you need to. A lot of times the people that come to this, though, they're really under the threat of dialysis or the surgeon's knife, and they don't have the luxury of doing that. But you see, I did have the luxury of going from the diet that I was eating, which was a junk food vegan diet made up primarily of sugar, flour, oil, and caffeine to the, what some may say, plant perfect diet a la Goldhammer that I eat today. But I didn't do it overnight. And so there's a piece of my story that a lot of people are missing. And hence, this is where desserts come in because, you know, people, people get upset with me because they think like, you know, I don't want to be like Bruce Wayne of, or what's his name? I love this actor, Adam West. I thought he was the, growing up, the two handsomest actors, in my opinion, were Chad Everett from Medical Center and Adam West from Batman. And, you know, he was a great actor, but once he did Batman, you know, he never really could work again in any other capacity. And because people know me in the space of weight loss or food addiction, it's like they don't want me to do anything else. At the end of the day, I'm a chef, first and foremost, hence the name Chef AJ, not food addiction expert Chef AJ, not weight loss expert Chef AJ. I am a chef. That is what I love. That is what my passion is. I do these other things to help people, but chefing is what I love to do. Te my favorite thing is teaching cooking classes. And so I'm going to talk about one that's coming up that I think you'll really like. But what you need to know is that I didn't transition overnight. I did get abstinent of sugar right away. So that's the truth. I stopped eating sugar, meaning white sugar, doesn't matter what you call it. And this, this, is, this is a trap that a lot of people get into. And Dr. Goldhammer talks about this a lot. He says, well, just because something is less bad doesn't mean it's good. So people want to argue for their addiction. So in other words, well, I don't eat white sugar. I eat brown sugar. I eat honey. I eat maple syrup. I eat agave. I eat coconut sugar. I eat monk fruit. I eat stevia, aspartame, xylitol, erythritol. If you're an addict, that's like, if you're an alcoholic, that's like saying, well, I don't drink vodka. I drink scotch. I drink beer. One thing you need to learn, and hopefully whether you ever see me again or take any of my classes, you'll understand that sugar is sugar, just like flour is flour and oil is oil, salt is salt. Yes, some may have marginal nutritional benefits. You could say, well, molasses has some B vitamins, but so what? We're not eating sweeteners to get our B vitamins. We're not eating salt you know, to get our minerals. That's what food is for. That's what green vegetables are for. That's what produce is for. So when I say sugar, I mean all sugar except for fruit. And my tagline has always been to satisfy your sweet tooth because I've been teaching sugar-free classes now. A lot of you don't know because you're either not on my mailing list or you don't live in, and you're not in my meetup groups. But I've been teaching for over 20 years at culinary schools a class called Satisfy Your Sweet Tooth Without Using Sugar, where we sweeten everything with the fruit, the whole fruit, and nothing but the whole fruit. So we don't use you know, any of those alternate zero calorie sweeteners, which by the way, are worse for your microbiome and worse if you're a food addict and sugar addict and, uh, or any of the sweeteners. And we do use a little date syrup. I, I personally don't use it, but there are some recipes that I can't get the way I need them to be just by using whole fruit. And the more I evolve, the more I'm not even using dates or date syrup, I'm finding ways to use other sweeteners like bananas or things like that. But I am going to give you some, don't worry, there's going to be some value here. We're going to learn how I do it or how you can do that. 
Yeah, Jesse's saying we like to argue for our addictions. Yes, well, I smoke filtered cigarettes, you know, <laughs> or I smoke menthol cigarettes. Yeah, people, people like to argue that their addiction is better than yours. But the thing is, is the truth is, if you look at the fact that what is it now? Is it 87% or 82% of Americans are overweight and 42% obese? I mean, come on, everybody's an addict. It's just, we all have different drugs and we want to argue that ours is the least harmful. Well, you know what? It's all bad. If it's not a whole plant found in nature, if it's manufactured in the plant, if you can't make it in your own kitchen, my advice is not to eat it. But of course that's hard. And if you can eat it and be happy and healthy, then God bless you. But I can't, and most of the people I work with can't. So I had never eaten a date in my life. Like I didn't know what it really was. I remember like sometimes um, at the, my grandfather was a doctor and uh, my mom worked for a doctor. And so like patients would give gifts and sometimes it would be like, you, you see them at Costco today. It would be like from Hadley's or from, oh, not Pepperidge Farm. What was that place that had the petty fours? I think it had a farm in Hickory Farms. And it would be covered in plastic and have this little fork and it would have like a pineapple ring and a maraschino cherry and some walnuts and dates. And it's like, who eats that? Like, ugh, dried fruit. Ugh. You know, I, I never eaten a date. I didn't really know what it was. I mean, I, you know, because I never seen one. They look kind of like cockroaches to me. And I'm like, anyway, so I think, I mean, I, you know, I don't know, because I don't know everybody that's in this space, but I think I was probably, if not the first, one of the first people that were plant exclusive using dates exclusively as my sweetener. And I was doing that at the restaurant where I was a pastry chef in Los Angeles. It was called Sante Restaurant from 2011, 2007 to 2011. So for five years. And then the restaurant was sold. And that's when I started writing books. So I had a whole life before Unprocessed came out on February 2nd, 2011, where I was a chef and I worked at a restaurant. When you work at a restaurant, and I, you know, I can't vouch for all restaurants because I only worked at one after I got out of culinary school. You, um, you know, you basically, you don't, you don't really have like an interview like you do for another job. Your interview is you just go to work for free for a day and you just make a bunch of stuff and then they see if they want to hire you. At least that's how it was for me. And that's sort of kind of cool how my name became AJ because it helped a lot getting these interviews because they seem to have a preference for males. And by having Chef AJ, they didn't know if I was male or female. A lot of times I would get to these I don't, it's not that I don't care for date syrup, but it's my least favorite of all the sweeteners I use. We can talk about that when we get a little bit, but it would be helpful to have the questions more towards the end because I don't want to forget what I'm going to say. But that is a great question, Becky. So moderators, if you're there, please make sure I, I uh, get that one, capture that one. So that's AJ is my name. So I, I only cook the way I, I know I eat. I'm not going to use something else. So I made these recipes and they hired me and they didn't care that it was vegan or oil-free or salt-free or um, refined sugar-free. I, I did I did use a little bit of flour in a couple of the recipes, but most of them were raw desserts. And these were rich desserts, by the way. Don't, don't think for a minute that a lot of the desserts that I make or put on you know, my social media are, are low fat, you know, like McDougal Goldhammer approved desserts, but people get mad at me because they, they just think, well, you're, you're in the weight loss space. You're in the food addiction space. How dare you? You shouldn't be posting it here, but it's my Facebook page and my Instagram page. So I think I'm kind of allowed to post what I want. And I'm, you know, if it triggers you, I'm sorry, you don't have to follow me. I'm sorry to lose you as a, a friend, but you know, that's the way it is because if you're, you know, there's a saying, if you're a hammer, you see everything as a nail. And if you're struggling with this addiction, you just assume everybody else's, but there's a whole world of people out there. I know them because I've got this meetup group with 500 people and most of them aren't overweight and they can eat some sugar. I see what they bring to the potlucks. And so I, you know, these are people that I, you know, also want to service, especially because I feel my, my greatest gift is, is creating delicious recipes within the parameters of what seems like many foods that are excluding. Whereas, you know, when you try to help somebody with weight loss or food addiction, I mean, it's really hard because there's so many excuses. There's so much recidivism. This, this, you know, any other field would be, you'd be a dismal success. But with helping people learn how to create delicious desserts, this is something I'm very good at because I've done it and I still do it at Rancho. And the thing is at Rancho, these are hands-on classes. So I'm with the people, I'm watching them prepare the desserts and I'm helping them, things like that. So. Um, 
I'm losing my space because I looked at the chat. I shouldn't have done that. I was talking about, oh yeah. So I started creating desserts uh, after I quit sugar in 2003 permanently. I never went back. I, I, I had one relapse the September of that year. I tell the story where I saw Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer uh, at the San Francisco Veg Fest where I was a speaker. And I had several pieces of a raw vegan tiramisu that the owner of the culinary school I went to uh, made, and it had agave, it had coconut oil, it had coffee, it had chocolate, it had salt, it had, I mean, it had literally everything I didn't eat. And that, yes, so I did have one relapse, but that was like it. I learned my lesson uh, because, you know, it's so hard to detox that at least my experience of having been a sugar addict for 43 years, it was so difficult to detox at the Optimum Health Institute. You feel so sick physically. And I felt so sick physically when I had that tiramisu that I never had another relapse. So I started creating desserts. And I think I'm one of the first people that did desserts exclusively from fruit that were also oil-free and you know, salt-free and mostly flour-free. A couple of my desserts do have flour. And, and actually the ones that do, I, I found alternatives to do it without flour. But in the in the bakery I worked at, you know, kind of how to make a cake, a German chocolate cake without flour. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is because I did not go from Coke Slurpees and Dr. Pepper to the A-plus diet I eat today. There was 2003, and then I got real serious in 2012. So we're talking nine years of me eating these desserts until I really started eating the ones like the apple pie that won't make you die. The ones that are really low in fat that are basically just fruit or maybe fruit and oats. I'm very good at figuring out how to use the fewest ingredients and the least harmful ingredients to make something decadent. Now, again, if you're such a bad sugar addict that you're eating like snicker bars, my, some of my desserts might not even be sweet for you uh, enough for you. But if you're somebody that doesn't already use sugar, I think you will really find my desserts delicious. So at the beginning, I was using things like nut butters. I was using things like uh, raw almond butter. I was using uh, unsalted peanut butter. I was using chocolate, unsweetened chocolate, not chocolate that had sugar in it. You can get chocolate that is just chocolate. So I was using these things. But the thing was, is I wasn't really concerned so much about my weight at the time, because I feel like the process of overcoming an addiction and weight loss are two different processes. And unfortunately, people come to different groups and they want to do both at the same time. And, you know, that's sort of like learning how to juggle and ride a, a unicycle at the same time. You can learn to ride a unicycle, which is something on my bucket list, and you can learn to juggle, which is something on my bucket list. And people that do both well can actually juggle on a unicycle. But when you're starting out, you don't ride the unicycle while trying to juggle. And so too many people, are trying to overcome and manage their addictions and trying to lose weight at the same time. I think you should do one. And I believe the most important one is to overcome those addictions first, because it's those addictions that are causing the excess weight. So that's just, that's my story. That's how I do it. If you can do both at the same time, go ahead. Too many people just try to lose weight without even looking at the fact that they have addictions and that the food that they're that that little bit of oil and sugar and salt that's sneaking in is causing them to have cravings and overeat. And then uh, uh, I really do think if you work on the addiction first, the weight just comes off. So that's what happened with me. So I use these richer desserts as methadone because realize all I ate for 43 years was dessert. If if I had, you know, I often say oh gosh, you know, I wish I'd met Dr. Goldhammer earlier, but I really feel like when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And if I had met Dr. Goldhammer earlier, I, mean, I, I think I would have failed miserably because I don't think when I was at that place of having Coke Slurpees and Dr. Pepper that I could have done his program. I think I would have failed. And I don't know if I would have had the success but when I finally met him, I had nine years of sobriety from sugar, oil, flour, and salt. And it was very easy for me to adopt the next steps of doing it low fat and doing, you know, doing like the sequencing things that, that have helped me maintain my slender figure. But I think if I had met him back then and he was around, you know, he'd been, he's been doing that for 40 years. I think for me at the time, the Optimum Health Institute was the best choice. So again, I looked at these desserts as methadone and they helped me uh, not crave the other crap, not never go back to sugar. But as time went on, they started being too rich for me. They started being too sweet for me. So if you look at the trajectory of the desserts I created, it goes from very, very rich, like I would say probably the richest dessert I make is the uh, peanut butter chocolate cheesecake. It's two, it's four layers uh, to desserts that are very simple with very few ingredients that are, are less sweet. 
but it took years to do that. And then it started like, for example, when I went off of Coke Slurpees, I didn't go eat kale for breakfast, which I realize now it's going to be really hard for people to do my program if they're coming from the place that I came from. When I first went off Coke Slurpees, I started having a chocolate green smoothie for breakfast because it was still better than a Coke Slurpee. So that recipe is in my book on process. It's called Nutrient Rich Chocolate Smoothie, and it's made with unsweetened chocolate almond milk. Realize no sugar. It's made with cocoa or cacao powder, a little bit of, of pomegranate juice. It's made with blueberries, banana, flaxseed, and dates. And it's very sweet. It tastes like a chocolate milkshake and it's delicious. It's low in fat. It really wasn't that many calories, maybe 400, but that was my breakfast for a while because that was the best I could do coming from where I came from. And that was a recipe that when I used to teach in the churches, I did a vol volunteer at, at, at uh, churches in Los Angeles, that was something that even children would eat because they couldn't see the smooth, the, the, the spinach in it. They didn't, you can't make it in front of the kids, but after it was made, they didn't know it had, you know, half a pound of spinach in it. But after a while, it got too sweet. And so I switched from the chocolate smoothie to a regular green smoothie without the date. So it was kind of like these rich desserts were sort of like training wheels. Like when I first learned to ride a bike, when I was seven, I had training wheels. And then eventually I was able to balance and I didn't need the training wheels. So it, 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 it was a period of time. And a lot of people don't realize it was a nine year period for me to go from, you know, obese and sugar addicted to starting my journey of not being obese and eating the way I eat now. So I think people don't give it enough time. As far as chocolate, I don't have a problem with chocolate, even though Dr. Goldhammer does. The reason that I personally don't eat chocolate is because I can't, because I found out from going through an immunologist where I found out, I went to the best guy in the world. He unfortunately passed away at UCLA. And uh, it, it, it's not an allergy, but every time I ate chocolate, I got a migraine headache and it was bad. I didn't make the connection because an addict doesn't want to make the connection, but it was clear as a bell that it was. And the medicine that I needed for the migraines was called Maxalt. And at the time, my insurance didn't pay for it. And it was something like, like $100 a pill. And I got to the point where like, is it really worth it to eat this, to spend $100 to take a medicine so that I can eat this? It's sort of like people that take uh, reflex medicine so that they can eat, you know, foods or things like that, or people that take pre-leaf so that they can eat foods that aren't on their plan. It didn't, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. And at the time I was volunteering at, uh, a retirement home in Pasadena and it was a poker dealer and the residents always had candy there and I would eat candy, but I wouldn't eat something non-vegan and they had, you know, seized candy and they were always offering me candy and they didn't quite understand veganism or why I couldn't have a piece. And so finally, one day I just said, you know, and this was the truth. I said, you know, every time I eat chocolate, I get a headache. So I, it doesn't make me feel well. And a new patient that had just come in was a prominent, uh, immunologist at the Huntington Hospital in Pasadena. He goes, well, that's because uh, chocolate is high in histamine. And he gave me the name of this prominent doctor at UCLA and I got tested. And, and so uh, he literally, because I was still addicted to chocolate, even when I wasn't doing sugar, those of you that have my first unprocessed might remember a recipe called fakeado. My husband and I were apartment managers then, and the residents drove us crazy. And every day after our shift was over, we said, this is a good time for a fakeado. Basically it was a caramel based on the caramel macchiato at Starbucks. And it was, it was still low in fat. It was completely sugar-free, but it was basically dates and cocoa powder and this, this amazing extract from Watkins called caramel extract. And, you know, it wasn't very caloric, but it, it, it still had chocolate. And so I knew it was going to be hard for me to get off chocolate, but you know, Hey, I'd gotten off, had gotten off cigarettes. I smoked in college. I got off uh, sugar, which was really hard. So what the doctor did that was really helpful to me is he wrote on a prescription pad and I still have it must avoid chocolate. And so of course it was hard, but I did it. And so the last time I had chocolate, I remember was Sunday, November 7th, 2010. It was a little fudge a truffle vegan, of course, made by chef Eric Le Chasseur at an event I was producing called healthy taste of LA. And I had the worst migraine the rest of the day. So it's not worth it for me to have chocolate. And luckily my husband has a congenital heart issue where he can't have caffeine. So he can't have chocolate. So we're a chocolate free home. But again, I'm not really against chocolate the way Goldhammer is other than, you know, it is high in caffeine and, you know, I wouldn't have it like late in the day or things like that. So hold on one second here for a minute. Let me see for if I'm where I'm at. Okay. So that, so it was a trajectory. It was a, it was a journey of me just, just getting cleaner and cleaner. And it didn't feel difficult because I didn't deny myself these treats along the way. 
So I felt that these healthier treats that I used as a trans as transitional, as kind of methadone, these were the gateway to a healthier life for me and permanent abstinence from these richer desserts, which I don't think, and by the way, like when I go to Rancho, I can't eat the chocolate mousse because of the fact that it has chocolate. But when I'm at Rancho, I'm not going to not eat one of my recipes that the student makes just because it's richer. I mean, as long as it doesn't have chocolate or something else I'm allergic to like black pepper, but we make the things with the nuts and things and I'll eat them while I'm there. You know, I just don't make them at home. So I'm not as um, gold hammer as people seem to think. Okay. So, all right. Um, yeah, so I I believe that for a lot of people, having these rich des desserts at the ready, you know, there's some people, and again, at the end of the day, you have to know yourself. If you can't make this without eating the whole thing, this might not be an experience for you. But I feel for many people who completely deny themselves any sweetness in life, having permission to indulge in healthy desserts, even a lot, especially during the holidays, can prevent a major relapse into a really dark area where they're eating real sugar, real flour. Now, these may not lead to weight loss during that period, but when I work with people around the holidays, I would call it the 63 days of abstinence from Thanksgiving to January 2nd. My goal for them is just to be abstinent from sugar and flour and alcohol, not to necessarily lose weight at that time. So I think that for a lot of people, having the ability to make healthy desserts that are fruit sweetened is what can prevent relapse because too many people are denying themselves. That, oh, I can't eat that really. Because you know what? I, if you took my apple pie, that won't make you die. Maybe because you've been denying yourself so long, maybe you would eat the whole thing, but I don't think you would continually eat the whole thing because basically it's basically oatmeal, but I found a way with textures and techniques to make things out of ingredients that people are already using to make them delicious. <clears throat> What I found is that the holidays are particularly difficult for people when it comes to abstaining from sugar. You know, when I see people relapse and when I get the text from people that have been in the mastery program, that they, you know, very few people have my phone number unless they work with me as a private client or been in mastery, they're, they don't text me on Thanksgiving day because like, oops, I had a piece of white meat turkey or oops, I had the... Um, what's it called that, that green bean casserole. It's always because they relapsed on a rich dessert. So they ate Aunt Edna's pecan pie or pumpkin pie. And I find that if they have had the experience of being able to create delicious, plant exclusive, high or low in fat, depending on their needs, desserts that are free of sugar, and had that planned and had that with them. And by the way, if you learn how to make my pecan pie or my ultimate pumpkin pie, you can see the thing about my desserts is because I was a pastry chef, you can just bring them to your holiday gatherings. People aren't going to eat my pecan pie and say, you know, oh, where's the egg? Where's the corn syrup? It's, it's made out of dates. They're not going to know because dates are 70% sugar. Dates are so sweet. You can do anything or I can do anything with dates that anybody else can do with sugar. And that's the neat thing about desserts. It's also vegan. People aren't going to eat the, the desserts I make or that I can teach you to make and say, well, well, you know, where's the dairy? Where's the egg? Even in cheesecakes. And so I think that if people had the ability to create healthy desserts and have them in their freezer, or had them at the event, they wouldn't relapse on the rich desserts. And once they do, game over for most people till January 2nd when they're 15 pounds heavy or and then they're all saying well can you work with people privately no I can't I have group programs but I don't have time to work with people privately because like I said I got three books I gotta write and I'm under a lot of pressure if you live locally you know of course we can do uh, the classes or if you'll come to Mexico so let me see what else I want to say here oh okay Anyway, I'm going to give you, I'm, I want to go into some tips on how you can sweeten things without sugar. But first, I just, if you don't mind, I want to tell you about a class I'm teaching that I'm really excited about. It's a really small class. And I know that a couple people here are signed up like Jesse and Susanna. So maybe they'll be able to tell you how excited they are to do that. But it's basically a dessert master class. And the reason I'm doing it now, because I was really going to do it in January, but then I, I had so many people saying, are you going to do your 63 days of abstinence? You know, um, this year. And I'm like, well, no, because um, I got to write my book, but I am going to teach this class because it is something I'm passionate about teaching people how to make healthy desserts. And I put a little link if you want to check it out. But, um, 
it, what's really different about this class, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. And then I'm going to tell you, if you don't want to take the class, some tips on how you can make your own desserts is that it's interactive. So, you know, the, the price of the class is about the same price as taking a hands-on class with me at Rancho. So if that uh, gives you perspective, it's we made it very, very affordable for a 40 hour, more than 40 hour experience with me live. My dessert cookbook will not come out till at least to 2023. So if you want that apple pie that won't make you die and the exquisite pear pie and all the new recipes you're seeing on social media, the only way you're going to get it is in the class because I'm not going to just put it on Instagram. Sorry, but you know, these recipes take a long time for me to bake and to figure out and test and uh, refine. That's if I can get the manuscript in in time, but then it might not come out till 2024. So my team and I, you know, I've a couple of wonderful people that work for me, uh, Morgan and Linda, you might interact with them if you write the help desk. And of course, my husband, Charles, um, we took a lot of classes because we wanted to create something that wasn't already in existence. And there's a lot of wonderful online classes, don't get me wrong. But in my opinion, if you're trying to be a great chef, you want to take as much in-person classes as you can so that the chef, like we do at Rancho. So when they're making the food, I'm tasting it. And then I'll say, well, okay, I have an opinion, but you know, I work with them. Like, what do you think it's neat? You know, some of my recipes like cauliflower bisque were created at Rancho working with people like in recipe development, like, well, what do you think it needs? And that's how we decided to add the chipotle powder and the smoked paprika. So obviously I can't have you in my kitchen or be with you, but what we're doing is we're making a class where we're actually cooking together. And this is, I think I've not seen anything like this in the world, correct me if I'm wrong, or at least in the plant-based world, because most of the questions the courses I've seen and, I've, and my team and I pretty much signed up for all of them and took all of them. And yes, you can watch it over and over for life. But they're pre-recorded modules and there's really no interaction very much with the instructor. Maybe they'll have you take a picture of it afterwards, but I'm actually watching you cook. Now, let me tell you how I got the idea for this. When the pandemic began, I started teaching classes with a company called Chibo. Some of you may have taken my classes. They were owned by General Electric. And my classes, the, the limit was 100 people. And all the classes I taught sold out like that. Now, I teach other classes that didn't sell out like in, in an hour and in even in-person classes. But what the difference was is with Chibo, people were cooking in real time with me. And there was a lot of people that are not expert chefs or dessert makers that needed to be able to ask me questions in real time, not make the recipe write me at the help desk, me answer them in a week. It was very valuable for people to cook with me in real time so that I could see their technique, I could see what they're doing and answer questions and they wouldn't have to wait. That's why the class is 40 hours. Now, of course, if you can't make the um, the live cooking segments that I'm doing, you can watch those. But the, 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 the cooking lab, if you can't make the cooking labs, it may not be the best class for you because that's where I'm going to actually watch you cook. The problem with Chibo is that they only did it audio. And so in other words, the people were really cooking with me. They could see me, but I couldn't see them. And so what would happen is they would ding me. And like, I'd have my hands all dirty from doing something. And then I'd have to wash them and, and push the thing and hear their question. And they could talk to me, but I couldn't see it. So they so they, they would literally say on an auditory medium, well, why does it look like this? And I'm like, well, I don't know. You know, can you text me a screenshot? So I'll be able to see what you're doing. And that's very valuable, I think. Also, because you'll get what's called stage time. You know, some of you know, I do stand-up comedy. And one of the concepts is you get better by doing and if you only are going to make a dessert once a year, you're probably not going to be as good at it as somebody like me that was working, you know, five years making desserts all the time. I could do it in my sleep. And unfortunately, I'm, I was so fast, which worked against me because I wasn't a salaried employee. I was hourly. But, you know, when you do something over and over, you get better on it. It's kind of like this idea of 10,000 hours to become a master. And, you know, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be practicing the art of dessert making and by the time the holidays come, you're going to hopefully be a master because you're going to have me to coach you. But it's not going to be auditory. It's going to be visual. And this is why I'm so excited. And this is why the class has to stay small. And we already had so many signups. We don't have very many spaces left, but click the link if you're interested in enrolling. The class is, going to, is really a 12-week class, but because I know that it's difficult sometimes for people to make a class after Thanksgiving, we're going to do a bonus session extended to 13 weeks. And that, class, that Saturday after Thanksgiving, we're just going to do something fun that's like a bonus. So don't worry if you have to miss it. The class is going to be 
two to five. So it's a long class uh, Saturdays starting next Saturday. You know, one of the things that I have a problem with with social media is if we live in a society where people expect everything instantly. Like, you know, um, I, I remember when I had a personal Facebook page and this was like, I haven't been on Facebook as a person for like 10 years. Somebody asked me a question and I didn't get back to them. And, and they were like, well, I'm unfriending you. It's like people are expecting instant results. You don't become a master. You don't master something instantly. And the problem with these wonderful influencer Instagram reels is that is not how making food works. You see these beautiful 30 second reels where they're creating something and you're like, wow, guys, that's not how food preparation works. You didn't see the four hours that they took to chop everything perfectly to do it. That's not how life works. And that's not how becoming a master works. So the way it's going to work is on the odd number classes, class one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. 11. There's the curriculum. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the information, I am going to be making the recipes for the week, and there's always going to be at least four. I'm going to be making them in real time and giving you tips and tricks and advice on how to create recipes without recipes. So you're going to watch me make those recipes. And obviously, if you're not there on the odd number of weeks, you'll watch the replay. I'm not going to be able to answer questions instantly. Like right now, you see, I can't communicate to you in a in a meaningful way and then want monitor the chat. I can monitor the chat when there's a guest, but not when it's me. So I really only see a little flutter of things coming up. So the class starts on the 24th of September and it goes to, I believe the 18th or whatever that Saturday is before Christmas in December. Of course, all the modules are recorded. So you still will be able to ask questions from watching me cook, but just like today, where you're gonna to have to wait for me to finish talking, I will finish the kitchen segment and make the recipes, and then I will go to my computer, and then I will look at all the questions that have been asked and answer them. And those of you that have taken courses with me, like Ultimate Reboot, know that even when a course is scheduled for two hours, Chef AJ leaves no question unanswered, even if I have to go, which was my record, four hours and 45 minutes for a class. But I don't anticipate this because we're keeping it very small. So then what you're going to do is you're going to practice during the week. Now, you don't have to make all the recipes. I mean, if you want to, you can. These recipes, most of them can be frozen, and this will be a great way to make friends with your neighbors. I have a new neighbor, and he's very excited because his kid is allergic to dairy and allergic to um, to to a lot of things. And this kid is so excited that because I'm like, what am I going to do with all this dessert? I mean, I will eat as much as I can, but I mean, still, that's too much dessert. If you have a job, you can take it. You'll make a lot of friends, believe me, when you do this. So during the week, you'll practice. And, you know, you don't have to, I, I don't want this to be pressure. I want this to be fun. And what the fun is, in my opinion, is then when we come to the even number of weeks, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, that's what we call the cooking lab. I'm going to be sitting right here and watching all of you on Zoom. That's why I have to keep the class small so that I can see what you're doing. And then, of course, you'll see me, but I'll be watching you in the kitchen and we will be cooking together. Well, you'll be cooking in real time. I have found that if I cook and you cook in real time, because I'm so fast and I talk fast and I cook fast, that doesn't work. It's different if you're with me at Rancho or here doing hands-on. So the way it's going to work is you can take all the time in the world. So when we do the cooking lab, if you're me, you can do all four recipes. If you're not, you can do one, but I'm going to watch your technique. And I'm going to also recommend that when you come to the cooking labs, maybe you'll have done one recipe during the week that you can show me either by maybe taking a photo or really maybe just showing me like maybe make it later in the week or freezing and say, this is what it looks like. And then we can talk about the results. So I don't get excited very often because I've been doing the same thing for a long time. And let's face it, I'm a little bit burned out in the weight loss food addiction space because most people don't do it. It's too hard. It really is. I mean, we've got some people here like Susanna that are, you know, escaping the pleasure trap, but it really, we're not set up to solve this problem. But I know I can solve the problem of having healthy desserts ready for you guys at the holidays so that you don't relapse on unhealthy desserts. So let me see if there's anything I forgot to say. And now I can answer your questions about the, oh, I was told I was going to tell you how to sweeten without uh, sugar. Uh, so, okay. So just with sugar, you, you know, this, this is the problem. And, 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 and I get this all the time, even from like my doctor friends of mine, they'll give me a recipe for their grandmother's cherry strudel and say, okay, you know, veganize it, SOS free it. First of all, just to veganize a recipe, 
if you're willing to use sugar, flour, you know, vegan butter, oil, salt, that is not a problem. Every recipe that has been ever made in the history of the world from baked Alaska to any kind of, you know, flan, everything can be veganized. Taking out sugar and taking out oil is a little bit different because you can't just take a recipe and just take stuff out. I mean, you can, but it's not going to come out and it's not going to taste good. And that's the same thing with, with, with savory recipes too. And that's why some of the class, we're going to actually be making recipes without recipes, because I feel like if I only teach you to do my recipes, you're going to never going to be able to do your own. And I want you to be able to have the skill. You know, I've been paid $6,000 for what you guys are getting for basically $25 a week. I'm not kidding. There have been chefs that have come to me and, you know, my rate to do this one-on-one when doctors send me, you know, it's, you know, it's a lot, let's just say. So I feel like this is a really good value because I really feel that before I discounted it $200, it was a good value, but I know the holidays are coming and I want this information um, to, to, to the people that need it. So you can substitute a dry sweetener for a dry sweetener. So in other words, but they're going to have different densities. So really, you can't really just take white sugar, coconut sugar, brown sugar and substitute them. You kind of can. But the thing is, it's hard, just like it's hard to take a recipe that has white flour and put in wheat flour or, or, or spell flour. These are hard things. That's why people that specialize like in gluten free baking or things like that, that's why they write books because they have figured it out. So you don't have to. But what I have found, and I know there was a question of date syrup, why don't I like it? It's not that I don't like it. It's just that of good, better, best, meaning the whole date being the best, it's not the best because it really is processed. Now, you can make date syrup in your own kitchen. I've done it, just like I've made reduced balsamic vinegar in my own kitchen. But it's laborious. It takes a long time. And by the time you do it, did you really save any money from buying the product? you know, you got to realize that these are not calorie-free desserts. Some of the desserts that we'll be making in the class, especially the ones I eat all the time, are fairly low in caloric density and very low in fat. But you can't just, um, I mean, you can, but date syrup is, it, you know, it's as, it's as caloric as other, dessert, other liquid sweeteners. It's about 60 calories. That said, I would still rather have somebody use date syrup in a recipe than agave. Agave is the worst, guys. It's it's higher in fructose than high fructose corn syrup. Fructose is metabolized in the liver. That's probably the worst thing you could have is corn syrup and agave. But agave can be substituted for maple syrup. I mean, excuse me. Well, they all the liquid sweeteners in a recipe, if you see a recipe that calls for a liquid sweetener, one cup, two cups of whether it's maple syrup or agave, the liquid sweeteners can be substituted for each other in the recipe will come out. But you also have to realize that they are different in the levels of sweetness. So molasses, brown rice syrup, they're not actually very sweet. So if you had a recipe that like a cake that called for one and a half cups of agave and you decide, well, I'm going to use molasses or brown rice syrup or barley malt because it's healthier. It's not going to be very sweet. Maple syrup is very, very sweet, but it's a little bit less sweet than agave. So those two I find can be substituted and date syrup can be substituted. It's going to be a little bit less sweet, but to me, that's good because the more you can learn to like something less sweet, the better off you're going to be. And, it, and it's a process and eating greens is something that really helps combat, you know, those sugar cravings, but you can learn to really enjoy desserts the way they are in Japan. For example, when I uh, worked in Japan as a, as a stand-up comedian and as an actress, they were largely influenced by the French. There's not a lot of desserts in Asia, but the ones they had were, were small and they, they, they guess they did use sugar, but they weren't as sweet as American desserts, like sickly sweet, like say a Cinnabon. That's why one of the first things we're going to be doing is the Cinnabon buns that are good for your buns. Okay. So liquid sweeteners can be substituted, but you have to keep in mind that they are going to vary in sweetness from agave being the sweetest to probably molasses and barley malt being the less sweet than rice syrup, then um, date syrup, and then maple syrup. Okay. So that's, that's, that, that's how I can do it, but it's really hard. And people ask me this all the time. They'll go, well, this recipe calls for one and a half cups of sugar. How much date syrup, how much date paste? You see, I don't know. And the only way and, and I know that I Love Date Lady has a formula on her website. And actually I can, what I'll do is afterwards, I'll post it in the chat. 
but I'm not 100% sure it's foolproof because remember, things have different densities. So date syrup has a different density than date paste, which by the way is dates and water. And if you're doing my class, you want to use my ratio of water to dates that has a different density than whole dates that has a different density than date sugar. And by the way, date sugar, you can't really substitute for white sugar because think about it, what date sugar is, is dates that have been dehydrated and ground. So it's going to be a very heavy, heavy result. So my favorite thing to use is the whole date or the date paste. I only use date syrup when I can't get what I'm looking for without it. And I try to not, not use as few dates as possible and use other things like my one of my favorite recipes, which we're not going to be doing in the class because I wanted the class to be so simple that all you needed is some basic equipment, meaning a food processor. I mean, you really, you know, you got to have something to make it. So I didn't want you to have to have an air fryer or a dehydrator or a Ninja Creamy, um, you know, or a Breville. So you basically need a food processor. It can be any food processor and some blender. It doesn't have to be a high power, but if you have those two pieces of equipment, you'll, you're going to be fine. And then of course, even with the pans where you're going to see they're interchangeable, if you don't have a spring form pan, if you don't have a cheesecake pan. So we're going to be talking a lot about that. So that's kind of what you're going to learn. And, um, I'm really excited about it. So I'm going to, now I'm going to basically look at the chat and unless there's uh, other questions about what I said and, um, this is, this is why I'm so thankful for Jesse and Susanna being moderators, because I miss a lot and I'm putting on my glasses, which I don't normally do because I'm vain. And remember my chat has disappeared. So I'm only going to see what you've typed recently and always put four question marks before. Um, okay. So were there any questions? Maybe not. Anyway, um, if, if you don't want to get the class, at least look at the page uh, that, that uh, Toby made a beautiful, beautiful um, uh synopsis of the class. So it doesn't say on the page when the master class is. Um, try this one because I'm pretty sure this one will say it uh, starts the 24th and goes to that Saturday before. Tell me if it's if you can see it here. It starts September 20th. Oh, that's not it. Hold on. That's why I don't like jumping screens. That's why I can't go when I see Facebook comments because I would have to jump screens. So here we go. Let me, this is just the information on the class. It's not the checkout page. So check that out. Let me see if he put the dates on it and accept cookies. See, you can accept cookies. If you take my class, you'll be able to accept cookies. Uh, hey, Charles, you know, that's interesting. Charles, um, is, is it possible that the dates of the class aren't on the checkout page? I'm looking at that now. You guys could be right. And if it's true, I, oh, oh no, here it is, guys. It is, if you scroll down, um, here we go. I found it. And the thing is, is I cannot offer refunds for this class because it, the seating is so limited that if you change your mind, somebody that wanted to sign up there, I just posted the dates. Okay. What is the dates that Becky wants to know? What's the difference between date syrup and date paste in recipes? So when I'm trying, so for me, from my perspective, if I'm making a cake, like a German chocolate cake, and I, I don't know if we're doing that one because we're trying to keep the class flower free for the people that have problems with that. Um, we, I need it to blend. I need it to blend. I need it to be really, really smooth, right? So date paste is, it doesn't blend as smooth. It doesn't blend as smooth as, as, as date syrup would. So if I'm using a glaze, so for example, um, the pecan pie, when I make it at True North, I'm not allowed to use date syrup. But when I make it anywhere else, I'll take two tablespoons of date syrup and brush it over the top for a glaze as if it was corn syrup. So if I need a glaze, I'm going to use a date syrup. Uh, so it's it's about dissolvability, for example. But um, so that, that's when I would do it. So I, if, if I can find a way to use date paste over date syrup, I will. Uh, it's cheaper because I can make it myself. So I really use date syrup very judiciously. Um, when you have your event with Takate, I don't believe that Rancho La Puerta allows people to come just for the day, but I don't know. So you might be able to, um, you definitely can't visit. I can tell you that. Um, you might be, they might let you take my class because the class is not on the premises, but my understanding is that is not allowed, but I would definitely contact the ranch for that. Um, 
Well, if you can't eat dates, you throw them up, you could use another fruit. You could use figs, you could use apricots. So the idea is you can make a paste of fruit out of any dried fruit. All right, let's see. I know there were questions earlier, but like I said, my chat goes really fast, which is why um, I don't see everything. So maybe I can go look at the YouTube and see if there was. My biggest fear is that one day I'll, I'll jump screens and I'll lose the whole show. That's why I won't. Why don't you care for date syrup? It's not that I don't care for it. It's just that, first of all, when I buy it, it's expensive compared to dates, which I buy in uh, bulk and very affordably organic. It's just more expensive. And to make it, it's just too labor intensive. So it's not that I don't care for it. I think it's a better sweetener. But again, it's still a sweetener. I don't know why I can't seem to find today's broadcast on YouTube. What's going on, YouTube? Oh, here it is. Okay, here we go. YouTube. Oh, there it is. Okay, I haven't I haven't been here in a week, so uh, <laughs> I mean is. my my computer. I gotta stop that. Okay, so let's see. Let me look at the the YouTube chat and see if if I miss any questions. Okay, and moderators, if you see anything, uh, but um. No, nope, maybe I didn't miss anything. Okay. Um, oh, what I was saying is I didn't want any special equipment, but my favorite recipe, the one that I eat all the time, the one that I brought pounds and pounds of at Rancho to make sure, you know, I got enough calories because we're doing so much exercising there. We're exercising from hikes at six in the morning to, you know, exercise classes that don't end till five. Uh, is my carrot cake granola, but that requires a dehydrator because I've never really had success dehydrating in an oven. Uh, Gail says, uh, in J I'm in Japan and the sense of taste is different and that, that yes, the sweet is less sweet there. I think the sweet is less sweet everywhere it, than the United States. Um, okay. So yeah, Becky, the difference in recipes is it, I don't have an exact calculation of how much if you're going to substitute, because again, to do that, I'd have to figure out, but like don't, you know, if I had a gun to my head and somebody said, you got to tell me how much date syrup to use in place of date paste. This is a guess that for every um, cup of date, let's see, I did figure this out once. A cup of date syrup, date syrup sweeter, it's more liquidy. You might need a cup and I don't know. I, I don't want to, I don't want to go on record because that is something that I probably could figure out and where I could figure it out is if when we do the outrageous brownies. Okay. So, um, yes, all the weekly sessions are recorded, no matter what, if you miss them. But I would say that if you're going to miss or if you need to leave early, miss the the even the odd number ones where I'm just teaching because then you can watch it later. Don't miss the cooking lab because the idea. So, so Susan, we're not going to give you a shopping list right away. And, and the reason is, is we're going to give it to you. I don't even know if we're giving you a shopping list, but I'm going to make a note to Toby if he can create one because there's not a lot of recipes uh, per week but we're going to give you the recipes after the first class, because what happens if we give things in advance, a lot of people, they won't show up to class. They'll just try to make the recipes on their own. We really are trying to make you master pastry chefs to the best of my ability. So we're not going to give you the recipes for the first module until the, the first class is completed. And then you have all week to shop and get, but it's not going to be an extensive shopping list because again, you're going to need some basics. You're going to need dates. You're going to need bananas. You're going to need oats. You're going to need some plant milk. Um, for some of the recipes, there, there are going to be some richer recipes as we get closer to the holidays. So maybe some nut butters and chocolate. But the thing that's kind of cool is that I can take limited ingredients like apples and raisins and, and reconfigure them into many different things using the same ingredients. You're going to need cinnamon. I'm going to recommend vanilla powder. So, you know, once people are signed up, we can give a recommended list, but you're not going to get it in advance because this idea is to treat you as if this was, you know, a real culinary course. And if you were studying with me in person, you wouldn't get that things in advance. You'd get it when you show up that day. Okay. Let me just see if there's anything else. Which way do I go, up or down? I just saw something about La Quinta. Um, Marley says, it sounds like an amazing class. I think it will be. I don't know of any class like this where the teacher is available three hours a week every single week for interaction. The other classes that we looked into, there, there really wasn't, it was like, here, watch the video, you do it. And then, you know, if you have a question, no, we're doing this in real time because we want you to make you an expert. Um, yeah. 
usually when people, somebody's saying people tell them they look too thin, Dr. Goldhammer once said to me that usually the people, not usually, always the people telling you that you're too thin or never as thin as you. It's just so you know, and usually when people tell you you're too thin, it's because you're exactly normal because everybody's overweight now. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you for the heads up about agave. Yeah, agave is the worst. It's so, and people think it's it's healthy. People think coconut sugar is healthy. And, you know, I mean, the thing is, is the American Heart Association, the American Cancer Society so, says that it's not, it's really the amount and that we should, first of all, there's no minimum daily requirement for any sugar at all. And if we do eat, it should be less than 5% of our calories. Well, if you're a woman that gets 2000 calories and a lot of the women I know don't even get that many, we're talking like hundred calories of sugar. So if you can limit it to five teaspoons a day, maybe you're okay. But if you have a soda, that's 16 teaspoons right there. Okay. Let's see. The water you soak in dates is considered date syrup. No. So that's date soaking water, which is very good for people that maybe want to use it to to sweeten a beverage. And by the way, when I make date, date paste, you, you don't throw out that soaking water. You're incorporating it because all the sugar has now been leached out of it. So uh, date syrup is a more, it's much more refined process. And again, you know, we could have concluded it, included in class, but it's so labor intensive. You got to sit there and boil and boil and boil and reduce and blend and strain. It's just not worth it for the amount of time it takes. And I, I did include a recipe in my book for it, but it's, uh, to me, it's not worth it you know? Okay. Um, and the water from date, dates, soaking dates, it's not going to like sweeten like a cake. It might sweeten like tea or something. Do I consider date paste a, li uh, a liquid sweetener? No, I consider it a solid, well, a semi-solid sweetener, you know? Uh, but, um, all right. And for those that can't do chocolate, don't worry, because there's there'll be substitutions for that class. And also carob powder is one of the best substitutes for chocolate, especially if it's roasted. It takes more like it. OK. All right. Um, I've only tried medjool dates and got sick. Is it possible other dates would work for me? Absolutely. Um, I mean, they're different. You know, they're different. They're different species, if you will. So, uh, OK. Class dates are posted on both the information page and sales page now. Don't worry, Susan. If you, Again, moderators, I appreciate you. You never have to be here if you're busy, but I appreciate you when you're there. And, uh, and Susanna has like 100 children. Well, no, actually, I think eight, but she's taking the class. She's lost over 60 pounds, and she's taking it because she wants her family who isn't on board yet to have the healthiest desserts possible. So that's another reason to take the class is to just create the healthiest desserts possible. You know, um, I was on Cupcake Wars with Chef Eric Le Chasseur and I remember uh, Neil Barnard said to me, you know, um, you draw them in, you meaning people that just, you're trying to get to be healthier, be vegan. He said, draw them in with dessert and then hit them over the head with the kale. So, okay, um, Jesse, any more questions? Otherwise, I do have to prepare for my next show with Dr. Joe Weiss, who's going to be talking about genes. Oh, here's a question from Hope. I, I can see it without my glasses. Why do I use vanilla powder instead of uh, vanilla extract? Because I'm a snob. <laughs> and, 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 and again, I, I'm a snob when it comes to ingredients. I, I, because I'm not spending money on medication and doctors and really even vacations because I don't have to pay to go to Rancho. I find that I really want good ingredients in my food. It does make a difference. And um, another another class earlier, this is it for this year. And if we run it next year, it'll be way out. So just so you know, um, it does make a difference. And the thing is, is if you, you know, if you're making something and comparing it to something else, you can't, you can't know that it made a difference unless you have them both side by side. And I've done that. I've done that in classes. As a matter of fact, I've, I've done it for um, when showing people that oil doesn't make a difference. When I started teaching cooking like 20 years ago, I would make like, like a black bean soup and I would do the obligatory saute the onion and four tablespoons of olive oil. And then I would make another batch without, and either nobody could tell the difference or they voted for the wrong one. So about with extract, when I started working at the True North Health Center 11 years ago, I'm, I don't work there now, but I often came for a special program two to five uh, weeks a year called the Holiday Extravaganza. 
Uh, Dr. Goldhammer did not allow us to use vanilla extract because either it had glycerin in it, which has sugar, or it had alcohol in it. And when I was a pastry chef at the restaurant, we had a large celebrity clientele that was in rehab for a drug or alcohol addiction. And even that small amount of alcohol, they were not allowed to have. And so I would make a vanilla water which ended up being not being long lasting and being as expensive as vanilla powder. And the brand I recommend is just get the best you can afford. If you go to my Amazon store, I put a lot of different ones in. I usually just buy the one that's cheapest at the time and not the most expensive, like the, the one that's raw. Uh, Nick DeVorn of Local Spicery has an excellent brand. I have never had a bad brand of vanilla powder, but you don't want to get the white kind, the Cook's vanilla that has sugar and, and all kinds of weird stuff. You want to get it where it has one ingredient, vanilla beans. So for me, I'd almost rather not use the extract if I can't have the powder. And, and again, this is not a huge deal breaker. If you want to take the class and use vanilla extract, it's just that those of us, you know, it's sort of like people that like, oh, I don't want to go to Ninja Creamy, but then you do and you realize every other machine is sucks compared to it. It's the same thing with the Breville. In, until you really start using vanilla powder, you know, Dr. Furman's a huge fan of it. He has a wonderful brand. It's just that he only smells up smells. He only sells a large amount. That's like $200. I actually bought it once and it lasted over a year. So it does make a difference. And also because when you're making, when we're going to be doing some of the crusts, if you put the liquid in, you get, you get the crust perfectly using either nut and date or oat and date, and you get it perfect. And then you add your tablespoon of vanilla and now it's all wet and liquidy again. I just find vanilla powder personally works better. And so that's just me. Um, -bum. Okay, so I just saw Jesse posted. How excited are you for the class? I'm very excited because this is when I'm, I'm a chef. I mean, I, I'm not a health coach. I mean, I don't know how to, I only know how to say one thing. Stop it. Like Bob Newhart or don't eat that abstinence. It's all I know because that's what worked for me. And it seems the easiest, easiest interest in helping others with that. What are your thoughts looking? What, what are your thoughts looking forward to? I'm not sure I understand. My thoughts are that I want people to eat vegan over not vegan. And I think the easiest way to enroll them in veganism is with a delicious dessert, because when you give them a fake meat or cheese, especially a fake cheese, because you're not getting the casomorphine. I mean, it works for some people, but like I said, they know the difference. They, but when you give them a dessert, they don't sit there if it's delicious saying, well, well, you know, where's the real sugar or where's the flour or where's the egg, you know what I'm saying? Or where's the oil? They don't know. They just want it sweet and delicious. So that really kind of was, you know, that was supposed to be my first book. And then I got sidetracked because I lost all this weight and people wanted to know how I did. And I told them, but turns out people can't do it. So it's time to kind of pivot. And this is what I want to do is do these interactive classes because I feel like just, that's why I'm retiring weight loss Wednesday on October 12th, because I do all these videos. They get very few views of these recipes because I think really the way, you know, um, you know, I, I don't like to use a fish analogy, but te you know, give a man to fit, give a man a fish. He eats for a day, teach a man to fish. He eats for a lifetime. So I want to, I don't want to teach you to fish. I want to teach you how to master the art of dessert making and be a master pastry chef. Like I believe I was in the restaurant. I don't think the brand matters as long as it's not the white colored one that has sugar in it. Um, okay. Okay. So that's it. I think, um, unless you guys have any more questions. I might even have time to take a shower now and change my clothes before the next class. Anyway, thank you so much for your attention, for being here. I hope that whether you take my class or not, you'll consider a life of abstinence from sugar. It's a very sweet life. And is there an email? If they're having problems, yes. Thank you, Jesse. And everyone, just know that my email is help. Help at chefaj.com. Anytime you have a problem with anything related to Chef AJ, help at chefaj.com. Uh, maybe post it in the chat if you can, if you're having trouble signing up, maybe we've reached the limit. That could be the reason it could, we could have reached the limit already. And, um, we're having a giveaway on October 12th for the 300th episode of weight loss Wednesday. We're giving away a Nutra milk machine and a Ninja creamy. So please be sure you're on my mailing list because you want to learn the what you got to do to win. And also remember, please watch from YouTube. If you watch on Facebook, I can't see your comments. So you're not gonna be able to win prizes. So I know y'all that are on Facebook, love it. But for my show and for my prizes, please consider going to uh, YouTube. Thank you, Ruby. Appreciate all I'm doing. And um, 
Yeah. So, you know, these recipes are not necessarily for diabetics, just so you know, some of them may be suitable. It really depends where you are in your disease reversal process of your diabetes, if you're type one or type two. So I would never say that these are diabetic friendly um, or weight loss friendly. These are relapse prevention techniques to get you guys through the holidays so that you know that when everybody else is eating pumpkin pie and pecan pie, you can do it without having to derail your plan and fall off the abstinence from sugar and flour wagon. Um, you love my tops. Thank you. They're, most of them are gifts. And I will say this, I get a lot of gifts and I appreciate it. People send them to my PO box. 50% never have a card. And when I go to Amazon and ask who sent it, they are not allowed to tell me. And I have all these gifts that I want to send thank you notes for, and I can't. So if you ever send me anything through the mail, please, um, sometimes it'll have like a, an address, but it doesn't say who it's from. And I want to be able to thank you. So please, if you send me anything, tell me your email or phone number so that I can thank you. Because like, for example, this was from Amy, this hat. So a lot of the things you see me wear were gifts and that's cool. All right, I'm going to go. And I hope to see you in the class. I'm excited that Jesse and Susanna signed up. I appreciate their support. And um, let's just have some fun and let's uh, make healthy taste delicious. Okay, come back in a little bit for Dr. Joe Weiss. Thanks, everybody.